Does this work? Oh, this really doesn't work. Levels, 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 levels. I just got something great in the mail today. It's a piece of software that I've never heard of from a company I've never heard of, which does something which you never hear about. This is Common Space. It's by a company called, I think, Six Floor Studios? Six Floor Media. And what it is, is a collaborative writing environment for schools to use. So it's like Google Docs, but from 1996. What I find particularly intriguing about this, and what I didn't discover until I actually got the discs and looked at them, is it's actually put out by Houghton Mifflin, the uh, folks who put out uh, textbooks and, and all that when you were in school. So that's kind of cute and I'm really interested in running this. The problem is, this is commercial software and there's a very good possibility, I feel, since it was distributed on floppy late in the commercial software on floppy era, these might be self-modifying disks. I think that's more of an 80s thing, but I don't want to take any risks. So I could set it to read only, but then it would just fail to install and I wouldn't exactly know why. What I would rather do is take an image of each of these disks and then write it out to a new disk and then install off of those. That's definitely best practices, and when you're working with anything that's this old, it's a good idea to make a duplicate in case, hey, maybe it reads this time, and then tomorrow it doesn't read, and whoops, that's the last time it ever read. That sort of thing happens a lot with magnetic media. I mean, the stuff fails. What can you do? It's old. The problem is, my ripping setup's not ready to go yet. I have a copy of NetBSD installed on the Optiplex, but in order to get to it, I have to move the cable over to that drive, and could just do that, that's not a big deal, but I decided this was a good moment for me to hook up the gadget that I got on my last big thrift store trip. That gadget being the Trios hard drive selector. These things are completely ridiculous. I had no idea such a thing existed. I mean, it's absurd. This is a box that lets you plug in three hard drives and then switch between them with a mechanical push button. Are you kidding? That's, that's absurd. Who does that? You don't do that with a hard drive, that's wild. Well, uh, apparently they thought it was okay, uh, enough that they made a second version of it, the Trios 2, which uses a little external control box instead of using push buttons on the device itself. So that one's pretty cool, but this is the one I'm interested in because it's got those mechanical push buttons. I have the feeling that that one's a much more advanced version of this. And since the other one's just a card and I can just look at it and see what the chips on it are, I think that disassembling this one is gonna be much more interesting because there's something to disassemble because the other one isn't actually in a box, and this one is, so I can actually take something apart. Is this coming across? So yeah, this will probably be quick because I have a theory about how this thing's constructed. I, I think it's just a handful of real simple digital switch ICs and then uh, push buttons connecting them. Probably nothing special. I, I think this is gonna be a very short video, but all the same, I figured it would be worth it. Cause I'm gonna do like I did with the VGA distribution amp. You know, I'm gonna dig in there and figure out how the thing actually works as best I can anyway. I'm not actually an electrical engineer, I just picked up some stuff. So I don't know how all the stuff works, but I have the feeling this is simple enough, I can probably explain it to you. So let's go. So yes indeed, I actually cleaned off the workbench. You never seen it this clean. I mean, you barely seen it, but anyway. So based on the documentation, this thing is super, super Chinese, but who's surprised? It comes with a bundle of cables, and it's not just data cables, it's also power cables. Because this thing actually switches the power as well as the data, and that's intriguing. Uh, it suggests that the push buttons actually switch uh, probably some big power transistors as well as the digital switch ICs. Assuming I'm right about how it's built. Oh, now this is cute. This thing's never been unpacked. There's actually an order form here from the person who bought this thing. Uh, they were going to put it in a Pentium 3 system. They they gave their hardware specs and everything. They gave info on what OS's they were loading. And then they just never did it. Oh, wow. This thing is very, very cheaply built. I mean, who's surprised? But anyway. So it's not actually held together with screws. It's held together with tabs. So let's go ahead and just get that warranty tag out of here. Yeah. Oh, God. They're not even tabs. I think... I don't think you push these in. I think you got to lift the outer piece up. Yeah, these these don't move. You've got to lift the bend the plastic on the the this part here. That's terrible. All right, so that's off. I think that's all we have to do. I think this will come up now. Eh, well, I thought wrong. There's a little more to it. Maybe you pop the front off next. Oh, there we go. Yep, there it is. Do I need to pop the bottom too? No, that's all one piece. Oh, okay, it's just another tab in the front, I think. Here's some little gadgets I gotta release up here. Oh, there we go. Oh man, is everything gonna be a fight? I gotta do this one too. Oh, there we go. Wow. Uh, so my suppositions about how this worked were wrong. 
So there is not much in here, to say the least. So this here is a quad clocked D latch. We have two double pull, double throw relays, a couple of transistors, and uh, then just a couple of support components, and that's all. Oh, but you know what I just didn't even notice? Here on the back, there's uh, actually more logic, so let's see what these guys are. 4066. So these guys here are quad analog switches. So we've got a quad latch and quad switches. And I'm not really sure what that adds up to. Gosh, how does this gadget work? Honestly, I'm not sure what this thing is doing, but I think it's some kind of trickery. I think they're doing something not quite on the square. I think they're taking advantage of some quirk of the way that these hard drives work. So in the instructions, it says that all the hard drives need to be set to cable select. So what does that tell us? I think what that means is that they're using these quad switches to trick the drives into basically not asserting themselves when they power up. But that's weird because that's weird because they've got the relays and the power comes out of here so it's not powering up the other drives if Oh, okay. You know almost certainly what that is. I'll bet what they discovered is that if you put three hard drives on the same cable and all you do is just instruct two of them to not operate by not selecting anything on the on the device selector, that what actually happens is the data gets picked up by the inactive drives and their internal circuitry screws up the bus. So probably, if I had to guess, what these quad switches are doing is they're disconnecting some important leads when you switch drives so that the drives that aren't active aren't able to mess with the bus signals. I mean, what else could it be? Well, okay, and maybe some of this can be discerned just from the schematic. Oh yeah, that's totally what's going on. Let's see if we can work out what it's doing. So I'm going to disconnect this ribbon cable so I can pull this board out and show it to you. But in order to do that, I have to be very careful. And this here is the reason why. If you look closely, you'll see that the right edge of that ribbon connector has two extra pins just hanging off the edge of the connector. So why would you do that? Why not just use the right size ribbon cable? Okay, well, so I've worked in electronics manufacturing and I can tell you that sometimes you just can't get what you need. So ribbon cable comes in standard sizes, and the only difference between them is how many rows there are on the connector. See, the connector has all these two pin columns on it, so obviously every one of these is only available in even numbers. And the only difference between those connectors is how many columns they have on them. Now to be clear, the reason ribbon cables are popular is because you can terminate a lot of wires at once. What's terminate mean? That means you don't have to solder each and every one of these. There's 20 wires here. If you were to solder each one of these at, say, 10 seconds apiece, that adds up to several minutes worth of soldering. You can do one of these in less than two seconds per end. You just slip, crimp, done. These connectors are called insulation displacement connectors, and the way they work is inside the connector there's a bunch of little metal teeth, and when you put the cable in there and then squeeze the back down, it crushes the cable into all those teeth. They go through the plastic insulation and right into the wire. So that way you don't have to strip each individual wire and crimp a little connector on each individual one or solder each individual wire. So they make these all the way up into 80 line and even more. So you can crimp connect 80 lines in less than a second. That's 80 wires in less than a second. If you, if you were the best soldering iron tech in the world, that would take you upwards of 10 minutes. And for most people it would take upwards of a half an hour. So these are incredibly popular in older computing. Nowadays, they use these little flat mylar ribbons or they've switched to lower conductor count for everything. Everything these days is uses fewer wires. They've managed to get a lot more compressed functionality into ICs. There's a lot fewer interconnects between things, da 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 da. But in these basic electronics applications, you still have a lot of individual conductors, even now. So these ribbon cables only come in even numbers because the connectors are all two rows, so each column adds two pins. So you can get 14 line, 16 line, 18 line, 20 line, but you can't get 19, obviously. That's fine in this case, because they are using 18 pins on the connector this is going into. And they do make 18 pin connectors, and they do make 18 wire ribbon cable. So why do they use 20? Well, that just comes down to supply. I've had this experience. When you're doing electronics assembly, you call your vendor and you say, hey, I'm out of ribbon cable. You were supposed to have some here two weeks ago. They say, well, the truck never came, so we didn't get it, so you didn't get it. What do you do? Well, what you do is you go in the back office, you dig up an old box of 20 conductor ribbon, and you use that instead. 
Or maybe you've got another product that uses 20 conductor ribbon. So you've got one product that uses 18, one that uses 20. If you buy two different types of ribbon, you just bought twice as much material. That sucks. So what you do is, for the 20 conductor, you use the 20 conductor. And for the 18 conductor, you use the 20 conductor. And the reason for that is that these are what are called dip connectors. That's dual inline pin. So if you look at this, you can see it's just a set of pins and then another set of pins right underneath it. So the difference between an 18 and a 20 pin connector is that there's two more pins on one end, which means you can comfortably connect a 20 pin connector to that and two pins will just hang off the end. And considering that consumers were never supposed to touch this, what was the harm? Now, of course, you probably recognize this type of connector as a sort that's used on your hard drive cables. And yes, that's the same thing. It's just a little more specialized. On your hard drive, they use special connectors that have a shroud on them that has a little cutout in it, so you can't plug the cable in upside down. It's called a keyed connector. That's a nice luxury, but there's really no reason to use it internally on something unless you don't trust your assembly techs. Also, those connectors cost more money, and also it doesn't let you do tricks like this. So yeah, more than likely, they're using this just because it cost too much money or it took too long to get the 18 conductor. But when you go to take this thing apart, you gotta make sure you do it right. Because if I put this back together and I get one of these off by one row, all right, so let's do a little tracing here. So if you look at this pin right here, this is the first pin on one of the IDE connectors. Or maybe, maybe it's the last pin, I don't know. Anyway, follow the trace. It goes from here, around here, to there. So this pin and that pin are connected. Now follow it again, and it goes there. And again, and it goes there. And there's no other connections. There could be one on the other side but I see no vias and I don't see any lines coming out from underneath the connectors, so that's not the case. So that tells us that these lines are completely isolated from the rest of the board. They're only connected to one another. So that supports my theory that all the drives are just connected in parallel to the same cable, sharing data lines. So you can tell by how regular it is that all of these are set up that way. So we can ignore all those. Uh, that guy there is probably a ground, so most likely it's punched into a ground plane on the other side. The fact that it's very, very big supports that theory. You can see over here, things are starting to get different. So let's trace. This one connects there, connects there, connects there. And this one on the bottom, there, 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 and there, okay. And here's where things get different. You see this one lifts up and comes over here. That one is connected all the way through. And then this one is going somewhere. We don't see it connected to anything, so maybe there's a trace on the other side, or maybe that one's just not in use. And then this one's connected all the way through. This one is connected all the way through. Yeah, so you can see what's going on here. So if we look at this one here, this is the fifth from the right on this connector, and that one goes somewhere else. If we come to the fifth from the right here, we don't see a connection, so there's probably a trace on the other side. Fifth from the right here, same deal. Fifth and right here, this one pulls off and goes somewhere else. So we have we can see now which are involved in this. Each one of the pins that is not bust straight through must be what they're switching. So let's find out what those are. All right, I checked the numbering on the other side of the board, and it appears that this is pin 40, and that's pin 39. So pin 39, 38, 37, 39 and 37, 36, 30, 31, and 23. 39, 37, 31, 23. Let's look up the IDE wiring and see what those are. All right, so based on what I just looked up online, here's what we've got. 39 is the LED driver. I know what that is, I'll explain in a second. 37 is one of the cable select lines. Apparently there's two of those, but they're only working with one of them. I think 38 might be disconnected, let me see. 37 and 38 are both cable select, but they've disconnected 38 completely, so they're only switching 37. Uh, 31 is the interrupter quest, and 23 is the right strobe. Okay, so here's how this works. They've done exactly what I thought they were doing. They're not only interrupting the cable select pins, they're also interrupting the right strobe and the interrupt request. I don't actually know that much about how IDE works, so I'm not sure what the implications of those are, but I can tell you that as a general rule in electronics, if you want to shut a chip off, you interrupt its clock signal. In the case of IDE, the interrupt request and the right strobe both sort of constitute clock signals, so that's what they're doing. They're letting all the drives light up, but they're switching off the lines that would allow them to actually interface with the bus. So they're getting the signals, but none of their intelligence is being triggered to actually operate, so none of it's actually processing the data. So that's fairly clever. This thing's actually even simpler than I thought. 
I thought they were going to be using some sort of uh, nightmare of multi-line, you know, 40 conductor data switches. But no, they're just blinding the drives. Pretty clever. Oh, and uh, that LED driver bit, that's because this thing actually has LEDs in the front of it to show you the disk drive activity. I'm not exactly sure why they do that instead of just letting the computer handle that. I think that might just be to illustrate which drive you're actually on as a reminder because otherwise you'd have to tell which one of the buttons was actually pushed in and that might be hard for some people. So yeah, that's um, hinky but a pretty clever device. Now the question is, does the other one work the same way? So I should take a peek at that and find out. If you ever wonder to yourself, why do they make stuff out of plastic instead of just making it out of metal? Metal's not that expensive. I just showed you why. You see how fast I put that thing together? In manufacturing, the speed at which you can slam something together is a huge part of the cost of building it. So the fact that you can just slam this thing together, bam, 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 no fasteners, no screwdrivers, no torque, no Loctite, that's a huge cost saver. So in anything cheap, you're gonna see a plastic chassis just because they're easier to assemble. Okay, so that thing's pretty cool. The problem is, I don't really have room for it. My machine only has two five and a quarter bays, and I have to put a five and a quarter floppy in one of them very soon, so I'm gonna have to use the other device because it doesn't take up a front drive bay. So let's move on to that. Oh, and it took a few minutes for this to click, but yes, it does interrupt the other signals, but that's not the only way it's selecting between the drives because it's got the power connectors and the big relays on there, so it's almost certainly using those as well. So it's not just disabling the other drives by inhibiting the data lines, it's also powering them off completely. But, like I was suggesting earlier, it's probably still interrupting the connection to those so that they don't induce a parasitic load on those data lines and drag them down or introduce static onto the line, or God forbid the transistors start operating off of the current going past them or something like that. Okay, here we go. Alright, so here's the other gadget, and this one is much simpler, although it's too complex for me to completely decipher what it does. See, this thing looks like a PCI card, but it's not a PCI card. See, there's no connectors here. The only reason this is on a board like this that has what appears to be a PCI connector on it is because that's how it mounts in the case. This is just how it holds itself into the motherboard so that you have a place for it to live inside your computer instead of just flopping around. So this thing's more complex than the other one. It's got a bunch of different options. You can configure it in a bunch of different modes. See, there's all of these different options for how you can configure it, and it appears to allow you to actually have uh, both a master and a slave drive selected, and I can't quite tell how that works. I think what it's saying is that you have to set the other two drives in the machine to slave, and then you can switch between the two slaves, or you can switch between three masters. Either way, that's confusing. I'm not gonna do it. I'm only gonna switch between two drives. I'm, I'm happy. I mean, what that means though is this device has a lot more intelligence in it than the other one did, or at least has a little bit more. But more importantly, they needed to be able to make decisions based on push buttons, which automatically means that you have to have state. You've gotta have it read the value of this push button, and if it's down, it has to increment to the next value and then stay there until you press it again. So unlike the other device, which was essentially all analog logic, there was no digital logic in that at all, this one actually has to have a computer in it of some kind. Now you could build this out of electronic components. You could build this out of transistors making like D flip-flops and whatnot, but in practice, nobody did that after the 80s. So what this thing has on it instead to do all that is what I believe is probably an FPGA. So see this winner here, is some kind of microcontroller or FPGA. Uh, you can see it has a timing crystal next to it, which means that it is a computer. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and peel the sticker off because I've got no reason not to. All right, we have a GMS97L51. And per Google, that is an 8-bit single chip microcontroller. So yep, that's just a little tiny computer that keeps track of all the values. All right, so the fact this has a microcontroller on it sucks because it means, oh well, we're not gonna find out what it's really doing because the microcontroller could be doing anything in the world. What we can do though is we can at least look at the connectors on the back and we can see if we see those same lines being interrupted or if we see different ones. Problem is, that's a lot harder on this one. See, because the connectors aren't directly over each other, they're not just straight bust through. They've got a whole bunch of vias and stuff going on. This line here comes up, runs over, and connects to here. So those two lines are bust together. But then what? What happens next? Well, I can almost promise you that on the other side of the board, there's a via that's connected to a trace on the top coming out over here, something like that. 
So I'm not going to try and figure this whole thing out. Let's just go back and look at the ones that they were using on the other device and see if those same pins are interrupted here. So that's going to be pin 1. So that means this should be 39. So I don't see a connection on 37 anywhere. So this is 31. And this one does pull off and go somewhere. Let's try and see where that's going. Yep, that's what's up. Yep, totally. Okay, yeah, so that's the deal. They're using the same approach on this as they are on the other one. So yeah, this is the same device. It's just got a lot more sophistication to it. And uh, instead of using relays, they're just using these uh, basic TO92 power transistors. So either hard drive power consumption had gone down, or they realized that the relays were overkill, or transistors got better. Now the other components on here are actually a lot more interesting than the whole rest of it, because they are 3861Q 10-bit bus switches. Okay, so what does that mean? These devices here, here, and here, these little bitty ICs, what those are are they're banks of switches. So when you apply voltage to the input of one of them, it turns on or off 10 switches. So why? Why that many? They must be doing something differently than they were with the other one, something significantly different. I'm not sure what though. This appears to still be switching power, still be switching the drive select lines, so I'm not sure what they're doing. And this board is unfortunately too complicated for me to figure out, but definitely a cool device and uh, hopefully it works because I actually do need to switch hard drives. So let's go ahead and get it installed and see if it works. Well, so right away we've encountered a problem. Uh, all the cable ports are blocked. So I gotta swap this with the graphics card. That makes me uncomfortable, but okay. All right, that's a lot more practical. I should be able to do that. And as long as I don't fill up all the ISIS slots, this should be sustainable. What? What the fuck? Oh, wow. Wow, now that I have not seen in ages. Look at that. An IDE connector with retention clips. Oh, there's no need for that. Oh, you know, it's worth pointing out this one doesn't have enough conductors to interrupt power to each hard drive individually, so this one can't be using that approach. It's got to be using the approach of turning off the data lines themselves. I'm not sure if it matters, but these are labeled HD 1 through 3. I just don't want to guess anymore. Wait, no. No, I'm full of shit. Oh, okay. So the 12 volt is always supplied. It's the 5 volt they deprive it of. Okay. Brown, red, orange. That's enough conductors. Okay, so they're switching power as well. That's good. It means your hard drive isn't sitting there burning up power when there's nothing going on. Let's get our case back on. And see this here is why the thing has an external power supply instead of just running off the computer. So you can switch drives before you power the computer up. Otherwise you'd have a lot of problems. So let's look at how this works. So if I just press master, it selects between the three. If I press the master slave option, it turns on a second light. If I press it again, it turns on the third light. If I press it again, it shuts off both. Now what happens if I set this to 3 and then press master? Yeah, it switches it back. Okay, so I still don't fully understand how that works, but all the same, uh, it makes a little more sense now. So the last light here says run, and I believe that 1, that'll light up when the machine is on, and 2, I think this thing won't let me switch drives when the machine's on. So let's test both of those things. All right, powering on. Oh, it doesn't look like it lit up. Can I switch drives? 
Nope. Okay. So maybe that light just lights up to let you know the drive is being accessed. Okay, and here we are. Dead frozen. Hard disk controller failure. Ooh, it didn't like something. So hard disk controller failure, that's very bad. That means that means the hard drive controller got so confused that it couldn't start at all. Let's try switching inputs. Nope, that's not gonna work. Okay, well that was an anticlimax. It doesn't work. And frankly, I have no idea what I would do to diagnose it. Everything's set up correctly. It just doesn't work. So it's been in a box since 2000 or whatever, and it's been touched by human hands, it's been beat up, it's been in a Goodwill. I touched it, you know, anything could have fried the circuitry on there. So the main microcontroller could have some cooked I.O. lines, or it could be putting fuzz out onto the IDE. Uh, it, anything could be going on. Or it could just be incompatible with this machine's ATA controller. Who knows? It, it could be doing something with the logic signals that just confuses the transistor drivers in the ATA chip. I mean, this is not something you're supposed to do. So it's not really surprising to me that it didn't work. In fact, honestly, I have the feeling this didn't work at all. I have the feeling this product is kind of bullshit. Like, I kind of suspect that it never worked very well. Like, oh yeah, sure, I'm, I'm positive that it worked in their lab. When they were testing it on, you know, ATA testbed machines, mules that they got from Intel or SIG or whatever, things that were designed solely to test perfectly compliant ATA controllers, yeah, it probably worked there. Or it worked on their perfectly compliant Intel brand Intel motherboards. They probably didn't test it on very many consumer machines. I don't know, I mean, this could all be BS, but uh, the point is, uh, it didn't work, and I'm going to get rid of it. Because even though I can get it working, I don't want something flaky in my machine that's going to cause problems later. I've had enough issues with this machine already. The last thing I need is for my primary hard drive, or God forbid my secondary one that I'm supposed to be doing all these images on, to get fried. I just I can't take that risk. So I'm going to go ahead and pull it out and I'll just do things the old fashioned way and I'll have to find a way to image these discs on Windows uh, until I can find a better way to do what I'm doing. Anyway though, I do think that my technical analysis of both these devices was accurate. Um, it's pretty obvious to me how they work and I hope that you at least had some fun with that even though the payoff didn't come. Although, honestly, seeing a machine boot up into one operating system, and then it boots up into another, you can probably find lots of other YouTube videos of that, so did you really need it? Anyway, thanks for joining me, and I hope you have better luck in your travels than I did on this one. Or did things go so poorly? See, as it turns out, a couple days later, when working on the machine with a friend, I opened it up to discover that I had failed to plug in all of the hard drives. So the hard drive controller error was actually because it saw something plugged in, which was the cable coming from the hard drive switch, but it didn't actually detect anything when it tried to talk to it. So after being ruthlessly mocked by the friend that was over, I hooked everything back up, and here it is booting into Windows. And switching to the other drive. And here we are booting up into NetBSD. So, as it turned out, despite me being a complete idiot, this actually turned out to be a perfectly functional product, which works really well, and has sensible safeguards, and was easy to set up, and overall, an absolutely fantastic piece of hardware. I'm really glad I picked it up, and it'll make my retro machine much easier to use in the future. So, for real this time, thank you for joining me, and I hope you had a good time, despite me being a complete doofus.